aversions and um, uh, inclinations that are going to be uh, felt experiences with them. Um, um, but these are, he wants to say, not necessarily associated with um, desires. Okay, so here on page 12, then, is this crucial distinction. Um, at, toward the bottom of page 12, this is 212. It says, if a pleasure necessarily, so a pleasure, a certain empirical sensation, a certain experience, something that has a certain phenomenological character. Uh, if a pleasure necessarily precedes a desire, then the practical pleasure, that is something uh, toward which we uh, act, must be called an interest of inclination. Okay, so inclinations are directed toward certain uh, feelings, certain uh, experiences, Inclinations are therefore going to be directed toward certain empirical ends. Uh, so if a pleasure necessarily precedes a desire, the practical pleasure must be called an interest of inclination. So if the pleasure necessarily, he says, precedes the desire, that means that we represent an end and make ourselves the cause of that end because it's pleasurable. That is because we have an empirical inclination toward it. So the, in that case, the pleasure, that is the feeling, the empirical uh, experience of the thing, explains why we will it. But, he says, very bottom of page 12, but if a pleasure can only follow upon an antecedent determination of the faculty of desire, then he says it's an intellectual pleasure. And the interest in the object must be called an interest of reason. Okay, so in this case now, the antecedent, there, there's an antecedent determination of the faculty of desire. So here, the faculty of desire is not determined by any kind of empirical feeling. It's not something that we will in order to achieve an empirical goal. It's something that we desire because it's an end that we bring about through our representation of it. But it's not an end that is, as it were, empirically desired. Um, okay, so, so that's the crucial distinction between um, two kinds of desires. Um, so I said that the faculty, the desire is affecting by means of some representations to become the cause of the object. So those representations, um, and there's a crucial difference here between two different kinds of desires based on whether the end is empirically determined, that's an inclination, or whether it's determined by reason. That's an intellectual desire. So, I guess I want to say one more time. There's always desires involved. The crucial, full comment, the crucial question is, what kind of desire is it? Is it an empirical desire, in which the object is given, as it were, as good through experience? Or is it an intellectual desire, in which the and the object is given as good through uh, reason. Um, okay, this, sorry, right, so, uh, so I said before that both we and mere animals have a faculty of desire, but only we have intellectual desires. Only we take ends to be good <coughs> through the use of, of, of pure practical reason itself. So all of the desires that animals, that mere animals have, are, as it were, empirical. They are all inclinations. Um, uh, 
Um, so, on 13, he says this. Um, he says, that choice which can uh, only be determined through pure reason is called free choice. That which can be determined only by inclination, by sensible impulse, would be animal choice. Human choice, however, is a choice that can indeed be affected but not determined by impulses, empirical ends, and is therefore of itself uh, not pure, but can still be determined to actions by pure will. Freedom of choice is this independence from being determined by sensible impulses, and this is the negative uh, concept of freedom. So Kant has this contrast here between choice, what he calls choice, and the German word is Willkür, and, and will, the German word is Willa. Um, and this wasn't so clear in the groundwork, but now it's something that um, becomes more important. Um, so, uh, let me put it this way. Um, uh, animals, mere animals, have a faculty of desire through their representation of objects. They can bring those ends about. Um, but they can't do anything, they can't choose to do or refrain from anything other than what their empirical inclinations give to them, other than what their instincts give to them. So you might say that mere animals can only act under uh, the ideal of pleasure, only under the ideal of their own happiness, only under the ideal of the empirical representation of some end to them as well. Um, uh, so, in other words, they're determined by their representation of some object as pleasurable or not. Um, and so they have the power of choice, but they don't have the capacity to choose on the basis of pure reason. Like we um, uh, so the faculty of desire says whose inner determining ground, hence, even what pleases it lies within the subject's reason is called the will, villa. The will is therefore the faculty of desire. The will is the faculty of desire. Considered not so much in relation to an action, but rather in relation to the ground determining the choice of action. Whether it is an empirical goal or uh, reason itself. Um, I want to just finish up by mentioning um, the division between the two books in the Metaphysics of Morals. I'm going to start by uh, talking about this a little bit more. Now. So I just want to mention what it is. He says, um, so this is on page 20. Um, he says, in all law giving, there are two elements. First, he says, uh, a law which represents an action that is to be done as objectively necessary. That is, which makes an action a duty. And second, an incentive which connects the ground for determining choice to this action subjectively with the representation of the law. Um, so, uh, any law uh, is going to have some action that's required and then some incentive, some explanation for the goodness of value of that <coughs> action by which wills can be motivated to do that. Um, and here's the key to this uh, division. also on 20 further down. He says, 
Um, that law giving, which makes an action a duty and also makes this duty the incentive, so the fact that some action is morally, is, is, is a duty, when that fact itself is the incentive, um, that law giving, which makes an action a duty and also makes this duty an incentive, is ethical. So that has to do with virtue. But the law giving, which does not include an, the incentive of duty in the law, and so admits an incentive other than the idea of duty itself, is juridical. Um, so we have a contrast here between et the ethical, that has to do with morality and virtue, and what is juridical, that has to do with justice and right. And the contrast here is what the incentive for the action is. If the incentive, the reason for the action being done, the reason for it being taken subjectively by the actor to be worth doing. So if we care why the person did it, if we look at the reason why they take that action to be good and are concerned that it's duty itself, then we're going to be considering this from the point of view of morality, from the point of view of virtue, from the point of view of the ethical. But if we don't care why they take the action to be good, if we only look at, so to speak, what was done, we only look at, so to speak, the external manifestation of their behavior. We only look at uh, the, the action uh, regardless of why they take it to be good. This is going to be the realm of, of right. So the doctrine of right is going to be concerned with the sort of compatibility the external compatibility of different people's actions, regardless of why they uh, take those actions to be good. So the whole discussion in the groundwork about the importance of looking at maxims and whether the shopkeeper is charging a fair price because it's in his long-term interest or because it's what duty requires, that's all about morality. From the point of view of justice, the reason why the shopkeeper charges a fair price is irrelevant. The incentive to him, why he takes it to be good, doesn't matter for our assessment of the justice of his action. Okay, so next time we'll look a little bit more at the doctrine of right and then uh, introduce the ideas of the doctrine of virtue.